On today's video, we're going to cover rebound adjustable shocks, high speed and low speed rebound adjustable. We're going to explain the difference between them, how they affect the car, which one's best. And by the end of this video, you're going to learn how that's going to make your car faster. So when we come back, we'll cover that. Rebound adjustable shocks. They've been around for a while. They're not nothing new. And even high-speed rebounds, not totally new. But a rebound adjustable shock has been around for a while. And we're going to cover today what that is and why we need it. High-speed, low-speed. Now listen, I get it. This isn't going to be your favorite go-to video, okay? Loads, spring rates, I get it. You guys love them videos. But today we're going to cover how to make a car fast, okay? And how and why we're going to do what we're going to do, okay? Rebound adjustable has been primarily done on the low speed part of the shock. This has been a standard adjuster we have had in the, in the shock since we first introduced adjustable shocks to the, to the sport. In this video, we will only talk about the rebound adjuster that is on the end of the shaft. Low speed adjustment is made from a needle that is placed in the shock shaft. Different needle designs have been used to change the curve that it produces. The needle fits into a jet and is placed at the end of the shaft. On this slide, you see you have the adjuster that's on the shock eye, a metering rod, and sometimes that's done differently, the, the needle, and then a jet. And we do have some different kinds of needles. The rebound adjuster, uh, the rebound adjustment is made by adjusting the knob on the end of the shaft. By turning the knob clockwise when holding the shock shaft in the down position, this will close the needle off. It'll put the needle in a closed condition. We always make that adjustment from fully closed to the open position that we desire. And we do this because it is easy to understand. So instead of going this way and going that way and back and forth, we go full close and we go five clicks open. The, and then that way it's clear to everybody. The needle design is highly important to how the graphic or low speed is built in the shock. The needle is, uh, has proven to have some problems with bleed control. And it looks like fixing it is going to be hard. And the reason I say that is because it's roughly probably been around since the 80s or 90s in our sport. And we've had basically the same design the whole time. And we're not changing it. It's not being fixed. We haven't addressed the issues. As you can see by this chart, how adjusting the needle is changing the zero point and increasing the overall value of the shock. The high speed numbers are not changing as much as the low speed numbers. As you see down here, the high speed numbers may have changed uh, 100 pounds, but the low speed numbers at the zero point changed a lot. That's a pretty good looking graph. And it was a pretty, it's a pretty good shock. We raced that shock. This table here is the force versus absolute velocity chart. You can see how changing the amount of bleed changes the zero and the low speed in the shock. Zero goes from 1,018 to 404. Uh, the high speed rebound changes about 100 pounds or so. And the low speed rebound changes, you know, about 750 pounds, 800 pounds. So the shock is changing as the knob is turned. It, everything looks perfect. The, the battle that we fight 
it will be shown on this chart. This again is this. This is the table for average or the average chart. You can see how the one inch number increases as we add bleed to the shock. This is because the shock is spending more time running through the bleed before it opens the stack. So we have oil going by the needle. And as we open the needle, we have more oil that flows by the needle, which takes the pressure that's building up under the shim stack longer to build. If you see this, this chart looks opposite of the last one we showed. And our, our full closed or closed plus one is low speeds at 57. As we open the shock out to 23 open clicks, we're at 178 uh, pounds of force at one inch. Notice that our high speed also went up. Okay, The average chart is combined of rebound open, rebound close, and the average between them two. The reason the chart goes backwards is the root problem to the needle. And that's how it flows oil. And when it stops flowing oil and opens the shim stack, then the rebound low speed control that is controlling the load of the spring is not working no more. Um, if you've watched a lot of late model racing and you, you, you know, they constantly talk about arrow. It's a big subject. Um, it's a big subject in the dirt late model world. And you race at a place like Eldora and you can't, you can't pull up behind somebody because it'll wash the air off the nose and you'll lose the nose of the car. You're going to lose the nose of the car because you don't have enough low speed rebound to control the nose of the car. It needs to be fixed. Okay, the next chart's going to show a high speed adjustment. So everything we've talked about so far has adjusted the low speed part of the shock. Okay, it's adjusting the bleed. We're changing the bleed. We're virtually no bleed to an open bleed. Okay. So we need to understand when's a good time to run no bleed and when's a good time to run bleed. We need to understand those things. And if you go, I'm dry slick all the time, is that a good time to run no bleed? This is why this needle and many late model guys are opening their shock in the feature and closing their shock for qualifying or heat races because they can't run minimal bleed in the slick. High speed adjustment, high speed adjustment. This is high speed adjustment, force versus absolute velocity dyno graph. As you can see, we are moving the high speed numbers, which is making the zero point move up the scale. Note, the bleed is not changing, so the grip and the car will stay the same. We're not changing the bleed in this. We're changing the pressure on the stack. A visual for this, we've got a 200 pound spring and we have that spring at one inch of compression, 200 pounds of load. We have a 200 pound spring at five inches of compression, thousand pounds of load, okay? These two springs have different load values on them, but they are the same 200 pound spring, okay? This is the same shock, but by changing the load value on the shim stack and being able to do it externally, this changes the entire shock. As you see in this chart, we have big separation between the first click and the last click on the high speed. And we have a zero change from about 1,000 to roughly 250. So we have a change across the entire rebound. This is high speed rebound. The beauty to this is this right here shock would be, that's great and proper English, but this shock right here would be every shock for a lot of cars for the right front. They cover them all in one shock. Uh, but the real beauty to this is 
It's not changing the bleed. It's not changing your grip levels. So when you need your car to respond to grip, it's not changing that grip level. We prove this by doing a pull test. And we'll show you that here in a second. Okay. This is a high speed adjustable shock force versus absolute rebound chart. As you can see, the zero is moving down as we reduce the load adjustment. This shock has one full turn of adjustment from close to open. And as you see, the zero went down, 989 down to 269, I believe it is. You see the one inch number decreased and you see the 10 inch number decreased. If you look over here, you see it says dot, seven, six, five, four, three. Okay, those are your adjustments. The dot is uh, full closed. It's a set screw aligned with the dot. Uh, and at full closed value, 21.23 seconds of pull time. At the five or halfway adjust, 20.97 seconds of pull time. This is telling you or showing you that we're not affecting the bleed. The bleed has the same value, okay? We have designed a test outside of the dyno to test load on the shock, okay? We build a machine to test load, and we test load over a distance, and we time that distance, okay? And we are, we are not doing it like, like the dyno. The dyno, I don't know if I can explain this well. The dyno produces a force, and the shock resists that force, okay? But the force is greater than the shock, okay? And same thing would be true on a, on a spring smasher. And I hear guys are doing this, and I don't agree with it, but they're putting their shock on the spring smasher and pulling it apart or compressing it and then reading a load and calling it a dyno number. That ain't no dyno number, okay? It's no real, it's not much value. Uh, I suppose if the shock was totally junk, you'd be able to tell that. But we're talking about uh, pulling a load that, changes because of the valving in the shock. You know, a dyno is so powerful it'll pull right through a given problem, okay? The car won't do that. So the pull test simulates more the car, what the car is capable of doing, okay, and not the dyno. But we do them both, we dyno and pull. Uh, that chart's showing you that. The next chart, this is the high-speed adjuster average dyno graph. As you can see, we are moving the whole value of the shock as we go to the open position. The decrease in the, num uh, in the one inch number is a result of less preload on the stack. And the fact that the pull times are, uh, the pull time is slightly less in the five than at the dot, this shows you that we're not changing the bleed. Okay, on a low speed normal needle shock at full close, the shock we showed in the graph, the pull time's around 11 seconds, 11 and a half seconds. At two clicks open, you know, we're, we're, we're one click open, three clicks open, five clicks open, we're down to four or five seconds, four or three, three to four seconds of pull time on that shock already. Okay, so our spring control. Uh, is very, very low, very poor. Uh, you see it here that the bleed is decreasing uh, in value as the shock gets softer. To set, to, uh, to set the shock to the desired setting, turn counterclockwise to the number you desire. The internal locking device will hold the setting in place. 
to see um, see the chart that's provided with the shock to determine what setting you want. If you're racing somewhere, okay, and you you want to go out Thursday night, you know, you're racing a Friday Saturday show Thursday night practice. Put the shock on, make the adjustments, go out and get your car to where the car is really good. Whether you have a right front and left front or both, put them on the car, go out and race the car. And then come back and say, I'm on a six, I'm on a five, and then go to the uh, trailer and pull the corresponding shock out. So if you buy the complete program and test on this and tell me what number you're on, we'll build a shock to that number. And we can do that because we're not messing with the bleed value. So we know the bleed chimp, we know the value of the bleed, and we can put it in there and build you a shock accordingly. So to adjust it, you need to remove the shock eye uh, and the high-speed adjuster knob is there. When, when the set screw and the dot are aligned, this is full closed. And this is what we call dot on your dyno sheet. To check, turn clockwise if the knob tightens and the shock is closed. If unsure, always turn the knob clockwise until you're at the dot. So 28, this is what we call 28 series shock. Um, it produces high speed rebound, okay, which is much, much better than low speed rebound because of the fact that we're not jeopardizing the bleed value. Okay, if we race somewhere where the shock was to need more bleed rebound uh, value, then we could put it in the shock and still have the adjuster on it. Okay, always check with your rules. This is a USRA legal B mod and A mod shock. Okay, there are classes that are this is not going to be legal in, and I do think it would be legal to practice on and test on. It'd be legal to tune your car in with, um, but it's not probably legal to race with. As you know, somebody at Alltech got DQ'd for an adjustable shock. Okay, don't I don't know who it was. I don't. It's, that's not important. I don't know who it was to be honest. But they had an adjustable shock on of some kind, and they got DQ'd for it. So I do know that this is not approved through Crate Racing USA yet, but you can test on this shock and determine where you need to be. And then we can build you a legal version of it, and you can race on that. Um, the shock uh, adjustment, you can make the shock adjustment to accommodate different track sizes, different track conditions, different grip levels of the racetrack. This allows you to do that. It allows you to run stiffer springs because you have better spring control. Uh, you don't have to run a 400 pound, a 350, excuse me, a 350 pound spring anymore because I'm not really sure why we're ever doing that, but we've been doing it. So you can get up in spring rate. You can be uh, keep the car off the racetrack, and you can have a better product. And then you have a shock here that will control those spring rates. If you want to put speed in the car, if you if you want to put speed in the car, speed is going to require rebound. Okay, without rebound, you're not going to build speed. Last week at the races, I had multiple people ask me for less rebound. We need to have less rebound and put more weight back on the left rear. Quit sacrificing your car's ability to turn for drive. If you want drive, make drive. If rebound's so easy, then screw it up, make rebound. Rebound's turnability is not easy. It's not that easy. Good rebound doesn't come that well. It's not that easy. Um, so don't sacrifice your car's ability to turn. Tune around your car's ability to turn to make your car faster. Work on entry. Work on entering the corner faster and using that rebound to turn the car to the center. Okay, work on those things. Don't work on taking rebound away. 
Okay, our cars have more flex in them today than they've ever had. Two things that are going on, they're lighter than they've ever been, and they got more flex in them. So yes, the cars are getting on the nose more, but it's because we lack knowledge in what we do and we lack knowledge in what's available for us. And this is what I'm trying to tell you right here today. This information is information that will make your car faster. You have to be willing to drive the car in that fashion, and you have to be willing to tune around the car's turnability. If the car doesn't turn, then adding left rear bite to the car isn't going to make the car turn. It's going to make the car tighter. It's going to make that situation worse. The fact that you can spin the tires and catch the car may get better, but that's not how you turn a race car. And it's 1978, guys. We've got to turn on the front tires. We've got to utilize the rebound. And the 28 series high-speed adjuster does a great job at it. So this is the type of video that you need to comment. I want to hear your guys' opinion. I want input from you guys. Uh, like and share and comment. Do all them great things to help the channel grow. A comment because I want to, I want to build some dialogue with you guys because I want to understand better where you're at. So if I'm going to teach better, I need to understand my students better. And I'm not going to lie. I feel like I don't. I feel like I'm on a different page than a lot of people. And I just need to understand, you know, where you guys are at. But I do need you to understand that if you want to put speed in the race car, the first thing you're going to have to do is have a car it turns and have a car it makes grip up on the front tires and turns on the front tires and then utilize the rear tires to push the car forward and then you'll have speed in the race car. We have equipment that you can purchase. Um, most racetracks are not going to let you race with them. Um, some will. They're just timing devices. They're not data systems. They're timing devices. And they allow you to time your race car. They allow you to understand where you need help at on the racetrack. Um, a lot of guys are living with a four-wheel drift. And they're living with pushing to the cushion. Okay? But this isn't fast. We need to resolve these issues. Okay? I, we race a local guy that's very, very good. I got a friend. It's not racing. That's very, very good at pushing to the cushion. Uh, has a lot of victories under his belt because he raced at a place that you could carry speed across the center and let it drift to the cushion and come off the corner. And for years, people created careers racing this way at those tracks. Okay, Those days are done. Because people are coming and racing against you with grip in their cars and their tires, and that grip is making them faster. And they're beating us because we're sliding across the racetrack looking for a cushion that's not there as much as it used to be. So we need to learn these things, guys. If you need help, call us 620-326-3152. Uh, Facebook message me. Uh, look us up on the internet, bsbgofast.com. Come find me at the racetrack. If you ever see me at the racetrack, don't ever hesitate to, to come um, to our trailer. Uh, approach me in the grandstands, along the fence, wherever you, we are, wherever you see me. If you need help, come and ask for it. Uh, that's what this is about, is us helping. If you want to Get more involved in, and, and in, uh, grow your racing program. Look at our team program. Go to our website. Look at our team, BSB Go Fast, and let us help you learn how to be fast. So that's what we're here for, guys. So as always, go fast, go left, and God bless you. We'll see you next time.